our um, last and uh, final session on the case studies. And I would like to invite Tomas Garbaravicius, the board member of the Bank of Lithuania, to present uh, the panelists. Tomas. So, uh, the final panel, <clears throat> it's a country, country panel, panel about country experiences. And we have uh, three presenters. <clears throat> I, I'll introduce them in the order, the way they're going to, to, to speak. Uh, first, uh, Martin O'Brien, head of microprudential policy from the Central Bank of Ireland. We have a tradition, I think in every conference so far, there was a presentation from Ireland. For Martin, it's the first conference, but you're welcome. Then Benjamin Weigert. Uh, from, from Bundesbank, uh, Director General of Financial Stability. For him, it's the second time he's coming to, to talk in our event, but also you see that some people uh, <clears throat> are, are regular presenters. And the final presentation by Hans de Wachter, Senior Coordinator on Microprudential Policy from Financial Stability Department at the National Bank of Belgium. For him, if I'm not mistaken, it's the first time here. Yes. So we have a Panel, interesting panel, and I would invite the first presenter, Martin, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Thomas. I know whether it's a good thing that we have lots of experience and hence we have uh, lots of invitations to come to these kind of, uh, of conferences. But uh, thanks very much to Thomas and to the organizers for this very interesting event that, uh, uh, and for the invitation to uh, participate. Um, it's, for those of you who think the conduct of macroprudential policy is complex and uh, enough, spare a thought for our colleagues who have to think about taxation, uh, which I think is infinitely more uh, complex. And now we are at the frontier of thinking here with respect to bringing the two of them uh, together. So again, commendations to, uh, to Thomas and the organizer for picking uh, topics that are really at the, at the frontier. Um, obviously, the usual disclaimer replies, anything I say in terms of many of views or opinions are my own, not necessarily those of the Central Bank of Ireland. Um, to give you a flavour of our macroprudential framework, uh, a number of you have already done that in your presentations. So, uh, the Central Bank of Ireland is the macroprudential authority. We're not, we don't have a council or other things like that. Um, one of the things that allows that to happen is the fact that the Central Bank of Ireland is both the uh, central conventional, central traditional central bank, but also is the uh, prudential supervisor for uh, banks, for insurance companies, for securities markets, and also has a consumer protection mandate uh, as well. Obviously, all of those things done in conjunction with you know, the ECB in terms of SSM priorities, etc. Um, and with respect to the uh, borrower-based measures, which are probably the ones that closely align to this topic of this conference in terms of real estate, we've had borrower-based measures now almost for five years. They were introduced in 2015. Uh, proportionate limits on high loan-to-value and high loan-to-income mortgage lending. Um, I can go in through a little bit of the detail of those uh, through the presentation, uh, but also um, uh, happy to do so in the conversation uh, thereafter. So, but my remarks today in terms of the, uh, this particular interaction, uh, I basically try to aim to address two, two specific uh, questions. Um, first of all, and, try and, and also try to aim to use, through the prism or through the sort of the, the, the backward looking story of what went through in Ireland. Um, I'll speak maybe a little bit about more current issues, but mostly the conversation will be about the historical experience. Uh, and that really lends itself toward, first and foremost, the first question that I'll pose is whether should macroprudential authorities be interested in property taxes? And to give you a short answer, the answer is yes. And I think that's been a general consensus across the presentation that we've seen here uh, so far. But the point that I'll make is that the indirect relevance may be just as more important as the direct relevance. And I'll, I'll flesh that out a little bit uh, in, in the forthcoming slides. And then in terms of what should determine that level of interest, how interest should we be, I think in broad terms, it basically hinges on the impact for the risk assessment perspective of what the authority on the macroprudential side has to take into, board, into uh, consideration. Uh, particularly with respect then on the indirect side, the impact or the broader impact that uh, the policy framework can have with respect to real estate and construction activity in the economy as a whole and a sort of more general equilibrium perspective on how that impacts on broader economic activity and potentially also broader aspects of the public finances. That's the sort of the spillovers and the interconnectedness bit. And then separately, the, the, the type of tax, 
uh, and the interaction in particular that those types of tax can have with uh, credit conditions and price dynamics. Again, issues that have been uh, rehearsed, well rehearsed uh, in some of the presentations that we've seen uh, so far uh, over the last uh, day and a half. Um, <clears throat> What I would also say is that uh, what I'll draw out a little bit more here is also that there are some perhaps lessons to be learned in terms of policy conduct as well. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll come back to that towards the end of the, the first part. So that's, most of my conversation will be about the first chunk, which is more sort of backward looking and given the, the, uh, our experience in Ireland. And then the second sort of high level question is then on the flip side, should fiscal authorities uh, care about macroprudential objectives? Um, and my short level answer is, not necessarily, but in some instances it might do no harm. Um, and what then should sort of determine that level of interest? Uh, so, you know, first and foremost, it's the overall policy objectives. Fiscal policy, as I mentioned at the start, is in you know, a much more complex area to be considering. There's an awful lot of other issues to be de dealing with apart from financial stability. Um, and uh, are we perhaps asking too much of one particular policy area in order to do a lot of heavy lifting in this space? Uh, and then the other aspect, which I think, uh, again, we might touch on a little bit towards the end, is the scope and the coverage of macroprudential policy in itself, uh, and where that is potentially limited in terms of meeting the overall objective of financial stability. Perhaps fiscal policy should have a bit more of an active role there. Um, and, uh, and this is especially with respect to some things with uh, cross-border flows, and we come back to that at the end. So to give a sort of... A, a, I'm not going to be uh, comprehensive on the tax system. Uh, number one, I'm not the expert on the tax system, so I can't be. But number two, tax systems are extremely complex. Um, so I've also picked out the three sort of headline sort of taxes that we've been mostly discussing in the, com in the conference so far um, uh, about you know, transaction type taxes, stamp duties, um, uh, recurrent taxes, you know, ownership type taxes, uh, and the mortgage interest relief. There are, of course, other issues like subsidies, grants, other kind of things that could, uh, could, could be at play. Uh, but I'm just going to focus in terms of our backward-looking exercise at these particular three elements. And you, just for comparison there, the sort of two regimes that we had, 2008, just before the, uh, the crisis kicked off, and then what we have uh, at present in 28, or what was the case in 2018. So if you look across the two, uh, sort of the three elements in, uh, for stamp duties, uh, first-time buyers back in 2008 were exempt. So if you're a first time entry into the market, you didn't have to pay stamp duty. Uh, all other properties had a particular level of stamp duty applied to them, or other buyers, I should say. Uh, and um, that, was, that uh, exemption for first time buyers was uh, eliminated. Uh, and now basically stamp duty gets paid on, on, on all transactions. We didn't have a recurrent uh, ownership tax uh, prior to 2009. It was first introduced or gradually started to be introduced. Um, uh, and well, I tell a lie. There was a on the books a, um, a recurrent property tax, but it was set at such a high level of threshold that nobody basically uh, was eligible to pay for it. Um, right now, uh, we have uh, what's called a local property tax. Um, there's uh, it is. Uh, but it is, in essence, more akin to a nationwide tax. Local authorities do get a lot of the do get eighty percent of the funds that are raised from this particular tax. Twenty percent of the funds are then dispersed to central government for redistribution purposes. There's a rate of about 0.18 percent on different various value buckets. So you have a value bucket of about 50,000, and it goes up in those sort of buckets up to a million. Uh, and the homeowner picks whatever bucket they're in, the midpoint of that bucket and they pay a rate of tax based on that, 0.18%. And then it's 0.25 for, for all values greater than, than 1 million. One issue and it was sort of raised with respect in some of the presentations, particularly yesterday, about the design of these kind of policies. Um, uh, our property, local property tax is based on uh, valuations that were made in 2013. And there has been no update on that since then. So there are two issues with respect to that. Number one, a huge amount, as you'll see in a slide in a moment, of house price growth has taken place since then. Uh, and number two, any property that was being built since 2013 does not have a valuation applied on it, so it is not actually paying stamp duty or uh, ownership tax. So there are some issues with respect to the design and the implementation of these policies that um, are, are challenging. Uh, and the government have uh, uh, put it for 2020 to have a, an update on the valuations and well, as a result, we'll uh, change perhaps some of the bans, uh, but also uh, consider the, uh, the properties that have been built since 2013.
And then the bet noir of mortgage interest relief that we've heard about um, uh, over the uh, course of the two days that was in place uh, in the run-up to the crisis and it was uh, eliminated, uh, was phased out uh, first on uh, new mortgages but then over time on, on existing mortgages and it is no longer a feature of the market. So those are sort of the three headline residential real estate related taxes. Of, of course, as, as has been outlined by a number of other colleagues, you know, there are lots of other things like capital gains taxes, which don't apply to owner-occupied properties actually, um, you know, inheritance taxes, because so these kind of things do uh, matter when, when we're thinking about uh, uh, issues. Um, uh, but broadly speaking, there is no, uh, those are the three headlines that we want to deal with. So what about the context then? Many of you may already know this, but you know, we've had uh, one of the mo more dramatic uh, uh, crises during the, uh, in terms of uh, house price declines and economic declines. So we had, uh, in the, sort of the, from about 2003 onwards, quite a substantial increase in this pace of mortgage lending, quite a substantial increase in the pace of house price growth, although these are expressed in levels in this particular chart, but you can, you can get a sense of the dynamics there. Uh, and uh, up until 2003, uh, the conventional you know, uh, argument is that this is basically an you know, uh, improvement in economic standards, a rapid convergence to Western European um, uh, standards, and that was basically reflected alongside you know, growing population, etc., in uh, a sort of a more sustainable although rapid, still a sustainable growth in, in the economy and in, in house prices in particular. Then the damage was done, 2004, 5, 6, in terms of the uh, uh, particular peaking in new mortgage lending and bringing house prices uh, sort of into a, a more vulnerable position in the market. And then the uh, correction through the crisis, uh, property prices dropping by in the region of 40 to 50%. Um, and then we've had this remarkable uh, recovery since then. Disposable incomes have, uh, or aver you know, overall disposable income, household disposable income has surpassed its pre-crisis peak. Um, house prices are still somewhat below the pre-crisis peak, but have grown quite substantially over the period. Mortgage lending has also uh, recovered quite uh, quite a lot. Uh, to give you a pointer, then sort of the borrower base measures were introduced around here. Uh, so we still see growth in, in mortgage lending, irrespective of having the uh, borrower base measures, because the borrower base measures weren't were not introduced at a point in the cycle where they would be uh, binding uh, in a broad sense. Um, so then we have the question is, well, what, why, why do we have all this massive uh, house price growth, which in more recent, term, more recent times has ameliorated a little bit, uh, but we still had you know, double digit house price growth for quite a substantial amount of time. So a bit about it is just recovery. If you have 50% fall, you're going to have uh, quite substantial uh, price increases. <clears throat> but I think another aspect of it speaks into the, some of the issues that we've touched on tangentially in this conference about broader housing market policy, broader uh, uh, issues around, in particular, supply, uh, and it, potentially also issues with respect to uh, you know, uh, rental market and zoning and things like that. Uh, I, won't, I won't necessarily need to go into the, too much detail there, but a lot of the commentary with respect to what has been driving house price growth uh, in Ireland for the last number of years, partially, uh, related to, uh, in terms of the slowdown, partially related to perhaps the borrower base measures becoming more binding, but also it's also related to a, 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 a sort of a delayed pickup in uh, supply. And so while we had quite uh, rapid you know, house price growth around here, in the absence of a supply response, that supply response is now coming on stream. The challenge for broader housing policies to make sure that the right type of housing is being built in the right type of places. That's obviously something beyond mandate of the central bank, but also with, you know, the fiscal authority is usually the person who also uh, deals with, in a separate department, issues around housing policy. That is certainly something that they would need to uh, perhaps uh, consider. But what was the actual, uh, the kicker, if you want to call it, in this respect, uh, for the, um, uh, the financial stability aspects of the crisis was not just the fact that you know, house prices were growing quite strongly, but that sort of the, the incentives and the misaligned incentives and the pricing mechanisms weren't working uh, and the credit conditions were so loose that broadly speaking construction and real estate activity took up such a huge proportion of economic activity. 
uh, and not just with respect, you can see here, with respect to, say, the construction share of total employment, you were reaching about its peak of around, you know, almost 12%. Uh, just before the crisis and then you know, collapsing quite dramatically. And you can't really see it in this particular chart very well, but in terms of overall employment growth, you know, quite, a, quite a significant amount of overall employment growth was driven just by the construction activity prior to the crisis, and then roughly about a third of the drop in employment uh, you know, through the crisis was accounted for by, by construction activity. Now, that means that you know, governments have uh, a lot of problems with their you know, taxes coming in and the welfare payments that they have to go out. Uh, and not just that, but because the level of transactions in the market starts you know, contracting, um, you get a situation where overall the public finances, which becomes, in the context of, a, of a, an overinflated property sector, can become in and of itself perhaps uh, too reliant on the revenues that are coming from that particular source. And that is, in essence, what was the case in Ireland. Uh, so as you can see, stamp duty uh, on property reached at its peak about 6% of total tax revenues. Uh, and dramatically collapsed then when the activity in the market you know, fell. Colleagues uh, in the paper that's referenced there looked at this in the broader context about overall construction and uh, real estate related contributions to the public finances uh, and, the contrib and, the, and the collapse uh, thereof. And you can see in the grey bars there uh, the, uh, the relative uh, you know, share of, uh, of, of, of the exchequer funding that is coming from these kind of activities. And the, uh, the, the, this sort of line here basically shows the, um, the proportion of that that is accounted for by, by residential real estate or by, uh, by residential real estate. And the collapse basically, not just in terms of stamp duties, but also in terms of, say, the income tax that builders were paying, the welfare payments that then have to be paid for unemployment purposes. Uh, it basically was the, the overall inflation in the economy that was a result of the, the credit fuel boom was reflected in the fragility of the public finances when the crisis hit. Um, so maybe one way of thinking about this from more from a, a house price perspective, uh, could a different approach to property taxation um, offset the buildup of the last crisis. Now, there are a lot of caveats with this particular calculation, and the chart doesn't really, you can't, it's perhaps a little bit difficult to, to find out, but basically this is the user cost, an estimate of the user cost of capital for housing. Um, we know in theory this has sort of a, um, you know, a relationship between house prices to rent, uh, and in this point of uh, view, you know, for in the user cost of capital uh, for housing is, is more positive, you, uh, all else equal, you'd expect the preference to rent, when it's negative, you know, there's a preference to buy. And there's a number of factors that go into this calculation, um, you know, and the taxation is one of them. Um, also, the, you know, the sort of the opportunity cost, what do you do with your deposit? Do you just keep it on, you know, could you, you could continue to save it, or do you put it into the, the fixed asset of, the, of, a, of a property? Uh, the cost of maintenance, all this kind of stuff. But a big feature uh, in you know, all of these kind of calculations is uh, expect expectations for house price growth. And when we do this very simple calculation using the Irish data, it is that which is the major driver of this user cost. It is the expectations uh, proxied in this context by you know, four quarter moving averages of, 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 of house price growth that is the major driver of the user cost capital. Um, and you know, I was going to do some counterfactuals with this to try and see, well, what if we had higher stamp duty taxes? Or what if we had something like, like this in the past? And I was like, well, there's no real point in doing those kind of counterfactuals because um, you can see here uh, the, the, uh, you know, the, the tax relief, for example, this is the mortgage interest tax relief, in the broader context of things, it didn't really, uh, in, in this static representation at least, it didn't really contribute much in terms of the user cost of capital. And similarly, in the more recent times, when you think about the kind of the stamp duties that are now prevailing and the local property tax, you know, they're, barely, they're barely noticeable in the context of this blue bars, which are basically the capital appreciation expectations. So, a few caveats with that I've already mentioned, this is purely static. We take no, uh, nothing on board with respect to the dynamic relationships that we know from some of the papers that have already been discussed here that go between you know, taxation rates and, and property prices. So that's one caveat to take on board there. Um, other things like housing supply is not really well addressed in this kind of framework. And as I mentioned to you before, housing issues around housing supply are probably driving you know, this uh, capital appreciation expectation, or that has been the case in the last couple of years. Um, so with those caveats uh, noted, um, 
even if I was to take a guess and say, well, what if we were to take a more you know, holistic view on this and trying to tease out what are the actual dynamic relationships going on here, I would say we would still need to have come up with, in order to eliminate this massive capital appreciation expectation, property taxes would have had to be exorbitantly high. There'd be no political economy uh, sort of situation in which you would have had to have uh, property taxes as high to eliminate this. So in that context, uh, this is probably a reasonable rationale for why we exist. So it is the pro-cyclical dynamics with respect to credit, with respect to actual and expected house price appreciation, um, which uh, macroprudential policy can be effective in, in, in trying to, uh, to mitigate. And indeed, for our own borrower-based measures, that is one of the main objectives that we have set, uh, not just to enhance the sort of the resilience of banks and borrowers, but also to mitigate the potential for the sort of credit house price spirals um, emerging. Um, so credit conditions basically is a bigger part of the story, I think, in terms of what happened in Ireland up until the, uh, uh, up in, uh, from the mid-2000s. Um, and on the left-hand side, you can see here, uh, so this is the, the, the distribution of, of uh, loan-to-income for first-time buyers. Uh, the median and the mean are, you know, have come down uh, through time and remain relatively static over the last couple of years. Um, 2015 are basically when we introduced the measures. But the, the, the issue with respect to the introduction of these measures is not necessarily that the, you know, the, the existing averages or median and means are expected to change. But what, does it, what it does do is that it brings in this upper part of the distribution. So, and this is, where the, this is where the damage gets done, if you want to call it, with respect to the, uh, uh, the, the fragility of the, of the lending book. So we no longer have LTIs of you know, five, five, to six, uh, five to six times, uh, five times for second and subsequent buyers. You know, they're really well anchored around the, the, the current setting of the uh, regime, which is, which is 3.5. What does this do for expectations? And why do I think that you know, credit uh, standards are probably a little bit more to do with you know, expectations than, uh, say, property taxation? Certainly recurrent property taxation. Um, well, we just look back at what happened when we actually discussed or introduced our own measures. So when we introduced the borrower-based measures, these are sort of one quarter ahead, one year ahead, and three year ahead price expectations um, from a survey that we do with, uh, with some of the others in the industry. And around the time that we introduced the borrower-based measures, you also had this sort of uh, reduction in uh, expectations for, for future price growth, particularly over the, the longer time horizons. So uh, it's uh, uh, not very conclusive evidence, I'd suggest. We, there is some academic work that colleagues have done to, to tease into this a little bit more. But you know, I think this tells the story in and of itself that around the time that we were discussing introducing these measures, expectations in and of themselves uh, uh, began, to, began to change in 24, late 2014 into 2015. And then you ask me, well, what about this? And I'll come back to my story about supply. So that's basically what the, what the situation is with that. So that's the sort of more backward looking. One sort of tangential issue I, I, I just mentioned here is that uh, the issue of policy uncertainty. Um, and it is fundamentally the case that the correction that happened in Ireland was inevitable. It was going to happen. Um, but when you're at a point in time in the cycle where uh, the market is vulnerable, uh, policy uncertainty can uh, contribute to at least the timing of when that correction takes place. Around the time of 2006, 2007, in advance of the uh, uh, election in 2007, there was a lot of uh, conversation in the public domain about potential reform to stamp duty. Uh, there was even conversation about eliminating stamp duty altogether. Um, and what I see here on the left-hand side is uh, sort of from, from Google, the relative importance of, of, um, of, of mentions of stamp duty uh, in, in Ireland's Google searches. And around the same time, you also see a pickup in the number of properties, this is this blue line, uh, that are listed on one of the, uh, the, the, property, uh, the main property selling website. So this period of policy uncertainty actually delayed entry into the market for people because they thought, well, you know, if I'm not going to have to pay stamp duty in six months' time, then I'm, it's basically, it's a demand side issue that you mentioned in terms of your presentation. Now, there's nothing causal. The damage had already been done with respect to the, uh, the fragility of the market. But when the market is in that fragile place, when it's at that sort of top of the cycle, this kind of policy uncertainty can be an issue that sort of triggers. Uh, and I think that is being an important context for our borrower-based measures as well. Um, so when we have introduced the borrower-based measures, we've been quite clear that these are a permanent feature of the market from our perspective. 
um, they are uh, introduced uh, in a, a structural sense in that way. Um, in that, and when one thinks about across the borrower-based measures, you know, there are, you know, within borrower-based measures, there's a, there's a broad range. You've loan to value, loan to income, etc. We also have these proportionate allowances that basically allow banks to issue certain amounts of loan to value loans above our limits, etc. So even within that spectrum, there are things that you would definitely say, these will never change. These are permanent you know, structures within, and the, the uh, expectations of people and borrowers should have in their mind that, you know, I will always need to, if I was to get a, a conventional mortgage, an average mortgage, I would need to have X percent of my uh, down payment. I would need to have Y percent of, uh, it would need to be a multiple of Y percent of my income. These are things that should perhaps be permanently in the, in the zeitgeist, in the psyche. But the operation of those things may well, uh, depending on where you are in the cycle, I think the, uh, the authority, and depending on the risks that are present, I think particularly in, in some elements of those, perhaps tweaking uh, the uh, proportion of allowances, for example, or the proportion of loans that banks can issue above those kind of limits, they might be the, the first port of call if there was a need for, um, uh, or, or a well, uh, or, or, or well rehearsed argument for um, uh, more uh, activist positioning. But more generally, these are structural elements in the market, and there should be conditioned expectations as to what is required for, 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 to get, uh, for to get a mortgage. I'll skip over this. This is basically where taxes are now. And then, so uh, toward the end, you know, should property taxes have a macro prudential objective? So, you know, the local property taxes, the one I pick out here, I mean, it, it's the, it has a conventional taxation objective. They want to collect money to fund local government and they want to do it in a way that's both operationally and economically efficient. Uh, and I think that is a, a, a good and a sufficient way for them to operationalize that. Now, there are challenges that they have in doing that, as I mentioned, with respect to the valuations, etc. Um, but simplicity, transparency, and equity and application, and an economic and operational efficiency, I think, is is a sufficient uh, condition for them to be considering with respect to that particular uh, type of taxation. One aspect where um, we we highlighted that maybe taxation uh, or fiscal policy could consider is a uh, where macroprudential policies can't go or haven't hasn't been able to go so far at least on the right you see the sort of the share of uh, foreign uh, investment flows into commercial real estate and commercial real estate is actually it, it's it's in its broadest sense it's not just doesn't mean like offices and factories and and, and shopping centers it also means sort of um, you know investment properties uh, apartments and things like that but you know, for the vast majority of the last number of years have been quite high. Uh, and the potential, and certainly in our risk narrative at the moment, the potential for sudden stops or risk rev or reversals, given that particular you know, funding structure, uh, is there. There are vast benefits for having this type of funding structure as well. You know, increased liquidity in the market, uh, potential, you know, distribution of risk sharing, etc. But there is a higher potential of potential of, uh, of sudden stops. And it, it, some of the colleagues uh, in this paper have, 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 have taken that and, and looked at some of the data with respect to what we have to try and tease these, these, tease these kind of issues out. So tax policy in those instances may have a role to play. Um, I think a first case may be that they do no harm as was mentioned yesterday, in terms of incentivization. Uh, but certainly, if it can't go in terms of incentivization, uh, there might be uh, some, some aspect in terms of, of cooling uh, of the market or, or dampening the, the cycle that might be uh, uh, necessary. So I will leave it at that. Uh, this is a summary of the, of the points. Um, but broadly speaking, going back to the two main questions, yes, we as macroprudential authorities should care about property taxes. It does have some issue with respect to uh, our, uh, our risk assessment in particular, uh, and you know, where we can't go, it, it's no harm if the uh, fiscal authority had consideration for those spaces. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to, to talk about um, uh, to, to talk about our experiences with real estate. Okay, so um, let me also start. I'm, I'm I'm the last speaker, I guess, of uh, 
of this session at least, or maybe also of the conference. But um, let me start by, by also thanking uh, the organizers, the Bank of Lithuania, um, for inviting me to participate in the first place and also to, to, uh, to present um, at this conference. It's, it's, um, it's not only a relevant question, it is a, it is a very challenging question as well. Uh, questions that can be addressed from very many different perspectives and, and I'm, I, I find out that I'm going to take a very different perspective than, than, than most of, of people have, have taken. Um, again, also, as, as, uh, as most speakers have done, I would like to point you first to the, to the disclaimer. So the, the views that I'm going to express here and in the presentation, but certainly also during, uh, during the discussion are my own and certainly do not necessarily reflect those of the, of the NBB. And I stress this because uh, actually I'm absolutely no um, expert in taxation Neither, not, not in Belgium, neither, neither uh, in theory. So, um, what am I? I'm, I'm part of the macroprudential team in the National Bank of Belgium, and the National Bank of Belgium is the macroprudential authority as far as um, capital-based measures are concerned. So, just to give you a little bit of a, of a perspective, the National Bank is the mandated macroprudential authority for our, for, our, for all CRR, CRD measures. We have an additional package of, on, on the national law of, of specifically liquidity and capital funding-based measures. But the crucial measures in this, in this respect on, on, on re, uh, residential real estate taxation policies, so the borrower-based measures, are not under our remit. They're, they're directly under the control of the, of the federal government. Um, the, the federal government has LTV, DSTI, DTI um, uh, measures, um, amortization constraints is not a necessary a, a, an issue in Belgium, as all mortgage loans are, are by construction, or almost all loan loans are by construction uh, amortized. So, um, with this uh, uh, introduction, let me... Uh, okay, let me... Um, present you what I'm, what I'm going to do. So the, my, my, um, fo the focus of my presentation will be on experiences and challenges um, in Belgium, and especially with the interaction between taxation policies and market prudential policy and, 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 uh, as we do it in the National Bank of Belgium. And what I'm going to do is I'm not going to be a very, give a very general presentation, but I'm going to focus on a specific set of reforms that um, in Belgium at least have had uh, most of the potential impact on financial stability. And the reforms I'm going to talk about are two reforms that have to do with interest rate or mortgage um, deductibility um, in general. Those um, have been um, uh, particularly strong, they're still, they're still active. And they have had um, some financial stability implication and led, in the end, also the market prudential authority, the National Bank of Belgium at least, to activate um, um, some uh, prudential measures, and in particular the Article 458 measure. So what I'm planning to do is just uh, give you a brief overview of the entire process from basically the, the, tax, the tax reforms through basically the risk assessments that uh, the National Bank did, the different kind of leakages, the build-up of vulnerabilities, and then eventually also the, the policy measure that, that we took. I'm not going to provide you with any normative um, insights. I'm not going to tell you how optimal uh, policy should be done. I'm also not going to give you prescriptive um, uh, advice. I'm just going to give you just the narrative and, and an account of, of actually what happened. I'm, I'm a privileged witness of what happened, and that's, I guess, that's also my comparative um, advantage. Okay, and in, and in doing that, I hope that I address like basically the list of questions that were basically posed to us as basically the, the target questions to be addressed during this, uh, during this presentation. Okay, so what are uh, the main messages that I want to um, um, reveal? First, and not surprisingly, I think that um, real estate tax policies in Belgium are not, absolutely not used for macroprudential measures. They serve multiple purposes, going from revenue generation to basically supporting um, house ownership, as well as um, uh, discouraging to some extent speculation. 
But that's it. So there is absolutely no role for macroprudential or financial stability considerations in, um, in the setting of this um, of these tax uh, policies. And in doing that, um, tax policies have not been extremely effective. And here I'm talking about effectiveness regarding the support of house ownership, which is one of the main uh, driving uh, motivations of the government in, in, its, in its tax policies. Um, and that is due, and that is also going to be like a main characteristic of, of this talk, that is due to the very limited um, uh, elasticity of housing supply in Belgium, also in the long term, which is, which is virtually um, zero. And as a consequence, these uh, tax policies have basically led to volatility in prices, to overvaluations, undervaluations, and basically to a capitalization of all of the subsidies or the implicit subsidies in the, in the, in the, in the housing prices. However, and that is where macroprudential policy comes into play, I guess, is that next to these direct capitalization effects, uh, tax policies have generated significant um, externalities, negative externalities, which have to do with the buildup of specific vulnerabilities. And these vulnerabilities have to do with uh, basically credit standards um, loosening, the buildup of leverage in the household sector, and also some, some price um, volatility. And then in the end, when we reflected on how um, we should respond to these uh, this tax policies, actually we come to the conclusion that prob potentially or probably the Belgian macroprudential framework is not uh, optimally equipped to deal with these um, tax policy considerations, given the fact that the macroprudential authority has only exposed measures, capital-based measures at its uh, uh, disposal. Just to run through a little bit um, the presentation, so what is the taxation uh, framework in Belgium? It's extremely complex. It serves different purposes, going from revenue generation to discouraging speculation, as well as, as promoting house ownership. And what you see in the slide is basically that the, the, the trust or the, or the, or the main um, structure of taxation is that transaction taxes and costs are very high in Belgium. So we have transaction costs, so for instance, registration rights of in between 10 and 12 percent. And that is basically to discourage uh, too much speculation. And at the same time, we basically compensate high transaction tax and costs by uh, very well, relatively generous um, um, uh, deductions, be it in tax reductions for the, ho for the first uh, home, or be it in the terms of um, uh, uh, deductions uh, of mortgage uh, payments. Also, what is relevant in this case is that there is a regional dimension these days to, to um, uh, residential real estate and taxation, in the sense that, unlike, I think, in very many other countries, all of the competences with respect to taxation, real estate taxations, have been transfer transferred to the regional governments and no longer under control of the, of the general government. Um, yeah, I'm not going to uh, discuss uh, these numbers. Okay. So what I would like to focus on today is basically there have been many the, um, um, reforms in the taxation system, going from f the reforms in the VIT, going to, uh, also uh, reforms in transaction taxes and so forth and so on. Those I'm not going to discuss because the financial stability implications of those reforms have been have been minor. What has been major and, and important has, uh, are the, tr the, the reforms in the mortgage deduction. And we have had two reforms, a first one in 2005, which basically revamped the total uh, mortgage deduction system and basically had as an explicit goal to promote uh, house ownership in Belgium. And then the second reform was a reform in 2015-2016 that basically uh, came with the, the reform of the Belgian state and, and basically transferred the competences to the regional um, authorities, regional authorities being much more budget constrained and had to actually um, reverse some of these, these uh, important uh, tax benefits. And, and that is also very relevant, basically decided to differentiate regionally among the, the, the deduction systems that would be um, applicable. So, what was the, the 2005 reform? 2005 ref reform basically uh, also called the housing bonus. Goal was to stimulate house ownership. 
basically introduced a tax deduction system based not only on interest rate deductibility, but also on capital, deduct capital amortization deductibility and life insurance premiums. So for in Belgian case, it doesn't matter whether you pay interest rates, whether you, you front load or you back load, it, it's, it's, it's indifferent. So everything is, um, is deductible. There is a cap to that. So not everything is, is deductible. You have a maximum cap. And then the tax deductibility is obviously is at the marginal rate. And then there is an, a booster on this um, reform. And that is uh, actually two things. Basically, tax deductibility was personal. So basically, couples doubled the deductibility of the taxes. And on top of that, there was no limit to this deductibility. So you could deduct um, interest and, and capital payments um, as long as uh, your, the, the maturity of your loan. And so there was a very strong incentive to increase the maturities of the loan. The net benefits of, 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 this, uh, of this reform were basically up to, dependent obviously on the length of the maturity, but also on, 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 on your loan, on your, on your marginal tax rate, but they were of the order of 33,000 uh, euros in, in the year 2005. And just to give you a reference, the, 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 the average house price at that time was 130,000 uh, euros. So it's about 20 to 25% um, increase. The second reform, and that's under 2016 reform, it's not only one reform, but there's many different reforms, is basically the, the, the regionalization of this deductibility. And here you have that um, basically two things happened. So regions became competent for tax uh, deductibility. Regions are much more budget constrained, so part of the, of the, of the advantages were, were reversed. But on top of that, different systems were applicable in the different regions. So, for instance, in Flanders, we still have like the deductibility, but deductibility just uh, decreased the, tax, the, the, the capped amount. In Wallonia, the French-speaking part of the country, they changed the entire system and they, they, they introduced a tax credit, which is income dependent. Um, and in Brussels, actually, and that is what you have in the survey and was, was, uh, was shown this morning, basically they, they abolished outright this, this tax deductibility. Okay. The, the, the effects of this are, are huge. So, for instance, in Flanders, you lost about 40% uh, uh, of, the, of, the, of the gains that you made in the 2005 reforms. In Wallonia, you could even lose everything if, if your income was high enough. Um, and in Brussels, obviously, yeah, you, you lost everything. Okay, so um, what were the main effects of those um, uh, uh, reforms? As I said already, like uh, housing supply in Belgium is extremely um, uh, inelastic. And as a consequence, what happened was that basically there was a very strong capitalization of the different measures into the price. The 2005 reform, which basically increased deductibility and the net benefit 30,000 euros basically generated a very strong um, growth spur um, in, in house prices across the different regions, whereas um, the reform in 2015-2016 did not lead to very strong um, um, price uh, decreases. At the same time, however, what happened was that um, there were very strong um, um, negative, negative externalities that, that were there in the, in the, in the form of, the, of, of risk um, buildup. So let me talk quickly about the impact of these tax reforms um, on, on financial stability. And the way we look at it is basically to look at whether tax reforms actually induced um, build-up of vulnerabilities. We find three types of vulnerability build-ups. The first one has to do with a very strong loosening of credit standards following um, uh, the, the first tax reform, the second one is then on leverage, and the third one is on housing prices. The first one, what is, oh, sorry, what is really important is to see that basically with this tax reform, unlimited in time, the incentive to increase maturity was really there, and that is also what you see happening. So before the reform, only 20% of all tax of all loans were, had a maturity above 20%. That increased drastically and remained very high. So up to 50% of loans now had maturities above 20, 20 years. And what was in particularly relevant was that it was the maturities above 25 years that basically gained a lot. So people tried to game the system and basically increase uh, maturities. 
At the same time, as in Belgium, there were no LTVs active. So there were no LTV caps, sorry, on, on Belgian loans. So basically, households could, could totally uh, pick up their, 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 their borrowing capacity, and that is also what they did, by increasing the LTVs. So the share of LTVs above 80% increased from about 40%, so that amount, to 50% and stayed like that. So in a general impact, of this first and initial tax or of this tax reform was a loosening of credit standards and a, and, and a deterioration of, of credit quality. The second thing that is really important of this is that obviously when households start taking up their, their borrowing capacity is that the household leverage ratio is going to, to increase drastically. And that's also what we saw. The 2005 reform basically led to a trendwise increase in the leverage of the households, and the, and the driving factor uh, to this increase in the leverage was basically the, uh, the mortgage lending. So consumer lending did not increase, it was all uh, basically mortgage lending. And then finally, we also tried to see how these reforms affect price volatility or price effects. And what we do, the way we did this was we used some kind of equilibrium, demand-driven equilibrium model in which we integrate tax reforms by introducing dummies. One a dummy estimated, the dummy for 2005 estimated, the dummy for uh, the 2015-2016 reform just basically imputed from, from the data. What we do find is that um, the price effects were, were relatively large, so the estimate is about 21% increase as a, as a consequence of this tax reform. The, the, the negative price effect that we had in 2015-2016 was imputed and was about 6 to 7%. But basically what, what our story is that volatility increases, but also basically the assessment of, of, the, of, the, of the situation in the residential real estate market, where after the introduction you went from an assessment of an overvaluation to an assessment, or to an assessment of, an, of, an, of complete undervaluation. Okay. So and that brings us to the, the last point, and the last point is basically then um, how to deal with these kinds of reforms and the build-up of vulnerabilities. And then the analysis of the Belgian system is that probably the Belgian system is not optimally equipped to deal with um, the, the, market, the financial stability risks that are basically generated by tax, uh, tax, tax policies. The first uh, thing to notice is that we are purely a price taker in terms of uh, uh, tax policies. The governments, be it regional government or the federal government, is not really on the demand side of, of, a, of, a, of an active cooperation. They, they see tax policies not as financial stability instruments, but, but other instruments. And secondly, what we do as macroprudential authority then is to internalize these potential um, impacts as we did in the terms of the, of the build-up of vulnerabilities. Um, in terms of market potential toolkit, tax policy is not used for financial stability, but also these borrower-based measures are not under the control of the market potential authority. They're under the control of the government, and the government is certainly not going to counteract its, its, uh, its desire to stimulate housing, uh, uh, house ownership, which leaves capital-based measures um, at, at, the, at, at the disposal of the market potential authority, and that's also then exactly what uh, we did. Um, so we started to intervene um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the residential real estate market on the basis of 458. So I think it was the first activation of 458 ever. Uh, it was very nice, but also painstaking to, to, get it, to get it done. And basically we did it in, in, two, in two goals. The first goal was that in 2013 we introduced a risk rate add-on of 5 percentage points. It's basically going to build off an additional capital buffer of about 1 billion euros on, on a total capital of 50 billion in the banking uh, sector. What we saw is that after the 2016 reform, so the, the tightening of mortgage um, deductibility, credit standards continue to uh, loosen, uh, leverage of households continue to increase, and so we, we, we conditioned to tighten additionally um, the market prudential measure, not only by having a linear risk rate add-on, but also to um, uh, augment this with a risk-based add-on where basically 
loans with, with bad uh, risk parameters, high LTV, high maturity and so forth, would be punished um, um, additionally. Well, and here, um, given that I'm running out of time, I just want to uh, conclude. Well. <laughs> you want me to? So, uh, thank you. These, I have to say, were relatively intensive country country case studies. That not not did, hasn't looked like after lunch. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, pretty intensive actually. What what you what you uh, described in 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 these three presentations. Uh, and maybe somehow one one common factor across the presentations, and maybe to start with, uh, I will start with stamp duty tax. Maybe in Ireland you have a nationwide version. In Germany, exactly that's the paper. The whole paper is based on that analysis. is based on on the regional application, so they, they varied a lot. And in Belgium, you don't have stamp duty per se, but you have registration costs, which are extremely high, 10-12%, I was actually surprised. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that uh, these costs depend, there is some regional application on that as well. Uh, so my questions would be two actually related to stamp duty or registration costs in, in the case of Belgium. Uh, you had the chat on, on sort of volatility per cyclicality of that income. Do you think something could be done in that respect? It's kind of, there is also a potential angle on the fiscal side from that point of view. And uh, the second part of the question would be, since this is, in, in, in your country's decision-making with respect to stamp duty, decision-makers in those cases, either regional or nationwide, what is, what is their objectives? When they change, how they change, what, what is sort of behind, the, behind those changes? And there are, depending, of course, on the application level. So, I don't know, maybe we'll start, Martin, from you. Um, so, with respect to your, your, your first point, I think, I mean, what will be nice is that the 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 approach that the fiscal authority would take would to uh, have a little bit more of a sort of an automatic stabilizer element to the overall mm -hmm. context with respect to stamp duty. So, uh, certainly, what what I think would be uh, very appropriate that when it was acknowledged that these are in essence windfall gains. Mm -hmm. Uh, that they get, uh, that they can be put away into uh, either a sort of a, a rainy day fund or be used to reduce you know, overall levels of, uh, of, uh, of sovereign debt, etc. Uh, those kind of issues would probably be the, the uh, as opposed to committing what in essence are windfall gains into more permanent expenditures. Uh, so from a broad, you know, mm -hmm. s sovereign stability point of view, that's probably would be uh, one thing we would, we, 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 we could point towards. Um, uh, uh, so that's basically what I would say. I mean, the what was, and your second point was with respect to the Decisions. the decision making. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, on that context, what should they be considering? Yeah. I. I, I uh, I, I, as I made, made the point of the president, I think there's fiscal policy in and of itself is complex enough <laughs> to be, uh, and it has a number of objectives that it has to, to, to meet. Uh, throwing in the additional of, of, of needing to meet some you know, financial stability objective over and above maintaining you know, sovereign uh, finance stability uh, can be quite challenging. Um, I, I, I should make the point more generally. I mean, it is slightly different in terms of the, the Irish case. Uh, central government plays a much more stronger role in these kind of issues uh, than than local government more generally, as is the case in our colleagues mm -hmm. here. Okay. So, in the case of Germany, uh, I mean, financial stability concerns don't really play a role when they set uh, uh, tax rates for for the real estate. Um, transfer tax. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of the sources uh, they, can, um, uh, they, they, they can tap themselves, so that's why they also increased the tax rate. They sometimes even doubled within the past 10 years. Um, and it, uh, it at least correlates with uh, budget uh, deficits and, and indebtedness of, of, of the lender. So it was just to uh, repair uh, uh, public balance sheets to some extent. Um, but um, but not so much. I mean, financial stability didn't play a role when they when they uh, or at least the discussion was not 
dominated by financial stability concerns. Okay, so you're saying basically if there was a deficit, they want to increase revenue, they increase a bit. But it's not like if they want to attract more people from other regions, they might lower. It's, it's purely budget driven. Mm, it's not. At least we well, haven't seen any uh, reduction in rates yet. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know whether we will see this in the future. But uh -huh. uh, uh, the metro, I mean, for example, Berlin is, uh, is a highly indebted um, uh, country, uh, uh, state in Germany, mm -hmm. Länder, one of the uh, uh, states. Um, and, uh, and they increased it to 6.5%. Uh, at the highest level, uh, and they increased it uh, uh, quite um, uh, uh, quite fast over time. So they were one of the first. Was it a reaction to increasing prices in Berlin? So no, no. Ma maybe okay. it was uh, also a re reaction to increasing prices uh, because uh, they they felt that the elasticity is quite high in terms or low in terms of okay. uh, 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 revenue losses. So they really were able to increase uh, revenues. Um, but um, um, yeah, so it's any financial stability considerations only indirectly, if any, if any, if any, yeah, if any. Okay, and in the case of Belgium, yeah, I'm basically a little bit the same of, of, of the previous answers. Uh, so financial stability, as I as I already mentioned, is not is not really a, a concern when when uh, setting these these uh, these registration rights and and what have you. So the, the numbers I showed you, so the 10 and the 12.5 percent on the slide, um, are numbers that that would apply to the to the to the regular uh, uh, transaction. Um, but there's lots of deductions that have done uh, some kind of a social uh, nature. So basically, you might you might have a, a deduction which is um, based uh, on on these rates for for. Um, Low price houses, low income families, uh, families with, with, with a, a larger number of, of, of children. So basically, what is done is you set these, these registration rights relatively high, basically to generate revenue, I would say, generate revenue from the, from, from the, from the right persons. So the persons that buy second houses, that don't really uh, uh, live, live there uh, constantly. And at the same time, you, you, you build, an, build in sufficient amount of exceptions to these rules that basically make it uh, socially affordable as well. Mm -hmm. So 10% is not going to apply to, to, uh, to an average okay. family. Okay. Uh, then I switch uh, to another actually chart in, in, in your uh, presentation to commercial property, which actually hasn't been covered in, in the conference, but it's also very much related to the la price of land. And you mentioned that probably uh, tax is the only way sort of to address macroprudential concerns in that sector because in all, all other tools they have leakages because it's very much cross-border activity, international activity. And um, in that regard, if you could all say something about your views, uh, if, uh, because all other sort of measures are potentially have, there is a possibility to avoid. And what do you think about taxation for, of commercial property? Mm. Oh. And so, stamp duty, and even, for example, stamp yeah. duty for commercial yeah. property transactions. Yeah. Yes, I mean, I mean, it's clear when one looks at, say, the development certainly in, in the Irish market that uh, not just in terms of, as I said, you know, traditional conventional commercial real estate, but also in terms of um, uh, in income generating residential real estate, that that uh, these kind of capital inflows have become more prominent. Um, the uh, uh, there is broader, but in that context, we, we also perhaps have to think about where the Irish market has come from. Some of that, some of that has been, uh, some of that inflow has been related to actually fixing the domestic banking system. Hmm. So it's 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 uh, uh, it's either buying physical assets that were uh, a hangover from the previous crisis, or, or or buying credit assets with respect to those collaterals. So. Part of this is, 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 is a necessary thing that should be happening anyway as part of the uh, of, uh, of recovery. Um, I think the challenge is that, yeah, and this is perhaps a, a broader perspective because it's not. It, it does also seem to be a, a general trend across the board that uh, you know the 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 the, the influx of of, cap, of cross border capital flows into real estate markets is not just unique to a number of countries. It seems to be a general across the board issue. 
And at that context, perhaps not only domestic you know, taxation uh, issues could be considered, but perhaps there does need also to be, uh, in a, in a, in a, a cross-border context, a, a broader uh, regional perspective taken on this, maybe within Europe as well. Um, uh, that you know, we should we should we have to fall back basically on domestic fiscal policy, uh, because domestic fiscal policy also has constraints, as we mentioned before. You mentioned yourself in your own presentation that you know the differentiation within the European Union is, is quite challenging. So uh, what I would say is that yes, tax policy can get into you know all the potential cracks. Um, if we were trying to target a more effective approach. Perhaps in this particular context, more uh, international coordination might be might also be uh, applicable. Okay, Benjamin. Uh, I mean, uh, in our case, the stamp duty also applies to commercial uh, oh. real estate uh, transactions. Okay. Nevertheless, they are able to uh, to structure the deal in a way that you can circumvent it um, <laughs> if you if you if you do a, a share deal, uh, for example. Then uh, it doesn't apply, but. In principle, it, it applies also to, to, to these kind of transactions. But I'm not, I'm not uh, sure, I'm even skeptical, that uh, uh, fiscal, fiscal instruments are the right instruments uh, mm. to address capital inflows from outside and so on and so on. So, um, irrespective of the fact if, if that is uh, uh, compliant with European law, uh, at least internally uh, in, the, in the common market. And uh, usually you cannot differentiate between uh, uh, buyers from outside and buyers that, um, uh, that, that just channel their funds via UK or uh, mm. Ireland to some uh, uh, mutual fund, investment fund, and they invest in, um, uh, in, in commercial property. So I'm, I'm skeptical. Okay. I was so happy that the topic of the of the conference was on residential real estate <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> this commercial real estate is, is simply is is simply too difficult and and basically before we we start talking about um, what kind of of policy approach would be optimal I think that uh, the, the one thing to do would be to first gather the necessary information mm -hmm. before to 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 try to think about uh, where the problems are where the where the exposures are and, and so forth and so on. So I think that, that uh, international coordination is certainly needed, but, but far beyond um, uh, tax policies or market prudential policies, it is first of all needed in, in, in data collection and so forth. And then uh, secondly, I think that um, uh, in a, so, so the, the commercial real estate being very diverse, I mean, it's like it's not one market being very, very many different markets with different properties, with different dynamics, with different international appeal as well. I mean, it's like this is, this is one important feature. It's not only the cross-border dimension, moreover, that, 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 is, that is specific. It's also the fact that many non-banks also in, in, in the domestic economy might be, might be exposed to this commercial real estate. Mm -hmm. And so you would like to think about, about uh, policies that could tackle both the cross-border dimension as well as the non-bank dimension in a very effective way. I don't see, to be honest, in the current market prudential framework as we have it, um, uh, tools that, that would do the trick. And mm -hmm. uh, just by default of having like very, very strong and, and performant instruments, I think that tax policies, if coordinated, uh, could offer at least some way out because mm -hmm. they can be applied granular, they can be efficient and, 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 uh, and so on. Maybe just one additional point. I mean, all of our perspectives are, have been sort of angled towards the uh, dampening the buildup of vulnerabilities or taming the cycle. I think, irrespective of that, uh, macro prudential policy can still work in terms of domestic resilience. So we know that there might be uh, particular asset markets like commercial real estate or mm -hmm. that might be more susceptible to changes as a result of higher exposure to, 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 uh, in, to, to, global, to the global financial cycle. Um, and we still all have, you know, mostly banks within our own remit that have significant exposure to these, these asset markets and the economy that has uh, mm -hmm. significant exposure more generally. So, you know, irrespective of whether our, our macro potential policy stance can effectively target or, uh, the build-up of the vulnerability, it can certainly try to enhance the resilience of the system that we do have uh, oversight over. Okay. Um, yes, that is true. 
Yeah, but I think that what Benjamin said, this, this, this leeway sort of, that you could buy a company which owns the commercial property in the way you kind of avoid uh, paying taxes, it's, it's important. Mm -hmm. Even here, with ta it seems that, you know, taxes should be the most, one of the most potent tools, but nevertheless. Uh, let me go back to, to Belgium. So there were two important changes in, in uh, this mortgage interest deductibility. But the relative impact was very different in the chart. You could see in one case it was a very big <laughs> jump, and then and, and the second change uh, hasn't had so much impact. What's what's the reason behind? It's uh, well, you can only speculate, of course, because I find there, there's there's lots of, of of analysis behind. But I think that that the main reason um, for the different uh, responses. Um, is also something that, that Benjamin alluded to, is basically the, the how much uh, uh, liquidity income collateral constraints bind or not at a given point in time. And in 2005, basically, um, conditions were, in a way, uh, binding, and that basically makes uh, tax uh, policies, deduction policies, very efficient, in a way that uh, you get like the full trust of, of the thing. In 2016, actually, what, what uh, so this very nearby, uh, it's like um, with, with Belgian banks really being like the, the core market of the Belgian financial sector is, is mortgage credit. And um, one of the responses that Belgian banks have had um, with respect to this, uh, this second reform, which was a regional reform, is basically to make uh, constraints, borrowing constraints, actually less binding. And so instead of waiting to, to, for, for, for um, uh, how would I say, like increases in LTVs, basically banks were on their own offering like uh, to lengthen the maturity, to increase the LTVs, no longer to accept the SDI kind of implicit limits and so forth. And that is, that is basically what, what has been going on and which has for the moment prevented that, uh, that prices on residential real estate markets are going back to their so-called, well, uh, imputed um, equilibrium value. Mm -hmm. It makes also the, the case for macroprudential intervention much more, much stronger, because if banks now already start in a very low interest rate environment, um, start to, you know, um, give like very, very specific extensions to, to already very, very loose uh, credit standards and conditions, then basically the question that pops off is immediately what, is, what are they going to do if interest rates increase or when, when the cycle turns. Mm -hmm. And so that's basically when, when, we, when we intervened. Okay. Uh, Benjamin, I have a question. This uh, stem beauty in, in Germany, I suppose it's not very popular among general public. <laughs> so what's actually how the population perceives, because the number is, is really, I think, in one of the charts, when you compare across countries, if you include other transaction costs, so overall entry costs are quite high in Germany. So what do you think overall, when you, when you take, when you sort of combine all the uh, entry costs together, what have implications for German housing market over the long term and, and sort of... Um, I mean... At the same time as uh, uh, prices increased over time, uh, uh, since 2009, there was uh, a, a developing discussion about affordability of, 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 of housing, um, especially for, for families and first-time buyers. Uh, so it sparked the discussion not so much about uh, the tax rate, but about mm -hmm. uh, other instruments uh, to subsidize uh, those households. So we are closely monitoring what's going on in the fiscal realm, Mm -hmm. what they are planning to do, so a little bit like what, what you experience, that there is a, a, a big reform to, uh, to, to support um, uh, owning a house, uh, and then we have to, maybe we have to, to react to, to these developments, but it's not like we, we, we counteract these, uh, these, these, these tools directly, only if, if vulnerabilities build up. But there is an ongoing debate to what extent we uh, should subsidize more uh, to, uh, to, to make housing more affordable to households. Mm -hmm. Okay. But there is no discussion to, I mean, sometimes there is a discussion to lower tax rates, but um, then at the same time, you are talking about lost uh, revenue, uh, and then you have a totally different uh, political economy. So. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I think it's time now to open the floor to questions. Uh, any questions, presenters? Uh, yes, please. 
as I was also puzzled about the Belgian experience, about how the mortgage loans developed, I wonder if uh, the second non-reaction, or rather the increase in mortgage loans, was not just the reaction of uh, banks to excess liquidity, which was provided by monetary policy by the ECB, given all these non uh, standard measures that were take were in place uh, rather in 2014 uh, rather than in 2004. I mean, might this have had an impact on the development of uh, the mortgage loan in Belgium? And my second is rather a suggestion to the German uh, colleague, uh, because you said you were lacking granular data on LTVs and so on. And I think there the Household Finance and Consumption Survey could help, because according to my knowledge, uh, all these things are, are asked in the survey, not with respect to, I mean, with respect to average LTVs, not with respect to the ones that were uh, in place when you took out the loan, but given that now three waves should be available, you might want to use that information as well. Okay. Maybe a quick answer to, to your second uh, suggestion. Um, we do that. Uh, unfortunately, it's not, uh, for, for our purposes, not representative enough uh, to, to, to assess uh, the risk. So it's, we, it's only every five years um, uh, and, uh, and, and we don't have enough uh, information from, from these sources to um, enrich our, our uh, vulnerability analysis, unfortunately. But we hope to get the data soon. Okay, Re regarding mortgage loans, I was like, um, mortgage, but uh, I'm sure that, that you do not mean that, but mortgage loans already started to increase in 2005, and that was clearly before liquidity was, was ample and so forth and so on, so that was certainly um, uh, an effect of, of, this, uh, of, of this first 2005 tax reform, which, which led to <laughs> increased deduction and, and so forth. Regarding the second one, so, so what we see is indeed um, uh, leverage uh, continues to grow. And um, your question, I guess, is why? Is this really has this to do with, with these tax reforms or is it more liquidity? And the, the first answer to that is that it's very difficult to establish what would be the equilibrium um, uh, leverage ratio for households that is compatible with a specific um, tax configuration to start with. So the, the, the fact that you have a very slow build-up of, of, of leverage is, 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 a, is a mere reflection of the fact that, that you're looking at stocks, and stocks are, are by definition very inert. But I do agree that, that certainly the, the strong competition in the Belgian markets, uh, basically to place the excess liquidity that the Belgian banking sector has, which is very concentrated on one or two of these key markets, the key market being the mortgage market, is certainly a key factor that explains why basically leverage can continue to grow. It's basically banks that, you know, loosen credit standards to, to levels not seen before, just to get rid of their, uh, of their excess liquidities. I agree with that. Okay, any more questions? Yes, please. Right. So, I actually have two questions as well. So, the first question arose by looking into Martin's presentation. Actually, uh, in Ireland, uh, you portrayed that uh, there is, uh, uh, I would say, a discrimination, discrimination by, uh, uh, by the type of the buyer when, when it comes to paying uh, taxes. For example, first-time buyers uh, have an exemption to, to paying uh, uh, taxes. So uh, my question would be, uh, is uh, different treatment of first-time buyers uh, justifiable from the financial stability perspective, or is it a more politically sensitive issue? So, uh, well, I would like to ask you just for your opinion. Uh, and the second question also uh, arose for, by looking into Benjamin's and Hans' presentation. Uh, the question would be, would you advocate for federal or local tax system? So, <laughs> again, just, 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 just a brief... Property well, taxation, uh, not overall. Opinions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, please, Mike. Um, okay, so uh, with respect to the uh, differentiation uh, between uh, types of buyer, um, uh, so I think the differentiation currently with respect to local 
with respect to the, the owner-occupied taxation is a feature of the, uh, the valuation. So uh, and when the valuations uh, underlying the calculation of property tax gets updated next year, there will be, uh, you know, what are considered first-time buyers or have been first-time buyers over the over the period will will, will be caught. And and first-time buyers uh, now do pay stamp duty as uh, as all other buyers. There are, of course, um, there are other um, uh, um, schemes that government have in place to support you know home ownership. It is another uh, goal of 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 of, of overall uh, of overall policy to to to, to promote uh, sustainable home ownership. Um, uh, so it, whether it is justifiable from a political economy point of view, um, that's something for the for the government to consider. When we come to think about it from the financial stability point of view, uh, and why we differentiate, uh, uh, so we do also differentiate in our own borrower based measures. And this was due to the fact that when we looked into the data, and we've we've actually renewed this analysis this this year, and it'll be coming out uh, shortly or towards the end of this year, that we did find that sort of the probability of default, of default was controlling for a lot of other features higher for current owner occupiers than for first time buyers, and that sort of motivated a little bit the differentiation of treatment. Uh, so sorry, for so us. first time buyers default less. Less. Okay. Yeah. Um, and in that context, that was sort of fed into the uh, the motivation for having a, a different treatment um, uh, from a purely from a financial stability point of view. Yeah, uh, what kind of uh, whether I like a federal tax more than uh, <laughs> uh, than a local tax? It, it all depends on 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 the structure of of your um, or the institutional framework in the country. We are a federal country, um, so we need for every level of of government uh, different sources of income, and uh, also in terms of um, um, uh, uh, democratic legit legitimacy, uh, it's it's good to have local taxes. Uh, that, that are determined by uh, local politicians that are directly elected at the local level, so that you you you, you always have a, a, a direct representation of of, um, of of the local people, and so property taxes are one way to to ensure that and um, uh, to make sure that um, uh, uh, people living in, in in those districts have a say in in what what's happening to the public goods supplied at the local level. So I'm I'm I mean. Every kind of uh, uh, structure comes with costs and benefits. Uh, you can have a centralized system. We've made a bad experience with the centralized system. That's why we have a very uh, uh, decentralized system. Um, but other countries have different, they, they solve the trade-off differently. Um, yeah, maybe to add to that, I mean, it's like as, as an econometrician, Let's be first speak as, as that. I, I like uh, very much like uh, differentiation, especially in the Belgian case, if you're a very small country like with, with very different regions, like neighboring regions and so forth and so on, that gives you a wealth of identification restrictions and conditions that allows you to basically identify and estimate relatively precisely the effect of specific measures. But and the, the reason why I'm saying this is because it's very difficult in a Belgian perspective to make also um, strong statements about, you know, optimal optimality of federal versus local taxes. Because basically the way it happens in Belgium is that, that the, the regionalization of the tax system is basically a consequence of uh, consecutive state reforms. And we have not had uh, the last one, I think. I mean, it's like Belgium is not like Germany, a, a steady state country. Belgium is a, a country in transition, and, and the end point, the steady state, I don't know when and where it will come, but it, it might be very different than the one we have. And I think that, you know, from the political economy perspective, it's very, it's very important to answer this question. I'm, I'm not sure whether I, <laughs> being on a public stage, I should answer a question like that. I mean, it's like, but I agree that. Um, there's, there's accountability, there's democ the, 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 the democratic uh, legitimacy, which, which are very important on one side. There's also the economic argument about frictions and so forth, which might, uh, which might favor uh, different systems. For now, what the system does, I can tell you, is that basically younger people are basically, you know, uh, uh, being forced uh, outside certain regions, basically because uh, transaction costs might be too high and it's causing lots of uh, uh, social costs as well. Mm -hmm.
Any more questions? Okay, no more hands. So we still have some time, so I won't give you easy time. <laughs> um, I have a question. Suppose <laughs> <laughs> the perfect world, you have full decision-making powers. What would you do with respect to property taxation in your countries now? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're looking at me first, are you? Uh, very good. <laughs> no, take, take, take your time. I mean, if, any, if you want to jump in, if somebody first wants to react. Uh, I think, I, uh, in my own personal opinion, I think what we need to do is to uh, ensure that the, uh, the, uh, the recurrent tax is more effective, okay. which means you know, updating the valuation metrics, which Low means issues. updating the, that, okay. those kind of issues. Um, I, I think more broadly in the context of, uh, you know, going back to the pro-cyclicality issue, uh, it has been uh, noted that uh, when transaction-based taxes are rising, that we should be able to you know, at least recoup or, or you know, put that, put that, put those gains away, mm -hmm. so that we don't necessarily uh, cause, call, call, uh, call into question the, the broader sustainability of the of the public finances. But uh, first and foremost would be to ensure that the uh, property tax becomes much more embedded. Uh, and much more uh, uh, effective as, a, as an automatic stabilizer. Mm -hmm. Valuations are key to that. Okay, thank you. Benjamin? <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my personal view is um, that um, in, in, in general, transaction t costs are probably a little bit too high in Germany mm -hmm. if you uh, uh, add all things um, uh, up. Um, and I'm Personally, much more in favor of uh, inheritance ta taxes than uh, on uh, wealth which, and which inheritance tax? inheritance tax okay. uh, taxes because they they also from an efficiency point of view they are um, uh, uh, quite superior to other forms of taxation. So, but mm -hmm. uh, that's my personal view. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, I I I would uh, go more into that direction. But there is a minefield as well because then people try to evade it and it's kind of all the trust and complicated systems that just avoid that. I agree this tax is very good. I mean, they're, they're always, I mean, once you introduce taxes, people try yeah. to avoid them. Uh, so you need to find good ways uh, to, to prevent that. Um, but uh, in, in, in general, uh, an inheritance tax uh, is, uh, is, is at least able to if you at the same time reduce uh, income taxes, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it may enhance efficiency. But again, that's, this is not my <laughs> uh, my capacity in the Bundesbank. So I know that's what <laughs> that's we wanted to know personal your personal view. So. <laughs> and please, yeah, I, I, I agree with both. So I would, in Belgium, make the system still a little bit more neutral with respect to the debt bias, which is uh, still there. I would, uh, I agree 100% with... Uh, Only for households or also for corporations, or in general? That in, in, general in general, but okay. especially for households. And then the recurrent taxes, uh, property taxes, that's a, that's a really big issue in Belgium as well. The system is so outdated, it's absolutely uh, no longer representative for the real value of the houses, and those things should be made uh, uh, dependent on market valuations. Okay, now time is up. And thank you to all of you. <laughs> Let's say thank you to the panelists. So, thank you. <laughs>So thank you for the panelists, thank you Thomas, and just the last points of information before I give the floor to Thomas to wrap up the entire event. So just to let you know that all the presentations that the speakers uh, allowed to share with you should be already uploaded on our website, as well as the videos that they've agreed to be, where they've agreed to be recorded, should be uploaded to the website in the upcoming few days. And. Uh, my final word is thank you for all of you who came here, who shared your experiences with us. And Thomas, the floor is yours. I'll try to wrap up somehow uh, to say a few words overall. Uh, it's not easy though, but uh, maybe uh, nevertheless a few points. So what I've seen so far, and actually when from some of the presentations, uh, I, I realized that we, we missed a lot. And there are a number of papers which evaluate uh, the effectiveness of microprudential measures, and they do all kinds of things, they get better and better, but they miss all that. <laughs> and it's a huge concern. You saw in some cases the impact of, of some of the tax taxation measures is, is significant, enormous, and it's all missed. <laughs>
And I remember there was, uh, some of you probably know that there is this so-called database called MAPET, Microcredential Policy Evaluation Database. And I remember that when there was a presentation, my suggestion was at that time, you should include taxation measures because they, they have an impact. So the decision at that time was not to include those measures, and I think it was a big mistake. So when the next update of the database, it should be included, because otherwise they ran all the sort of uh, kind of metric exercises and they miss a lot, as we've just seen. In this way, you could the first, maybe if you see a paper on some analysis, ask a question, have you included taxation measures? <laughs> it's the first question to ask now, I think, from my point of view. Um, the second point, um, what, what I've heard, at least my take would be, it's certainly there is a possibility, there is room, but of course it's a question of whether there's an appetite to use stamp duty tax more actively depending on, on market conditions. But of course, political economy, it's fiscal tool, and so on. Uh, whereas the second conclusion is, is pretty obvious. I think it's, it's, it's an easy, easy, remove mortgage interest deductibility. It's so clear. Uh, but when I, when I saw, see an example like in Belgium, it's so complicated, so sophisticated, so big tables around. You, you can understand it's deeply entrenched in the system. It's part of a country. <laughs> and to remove it, no matter what you say, there would be, probably will be huge opposition to that. But nevertheless, uh, I think it's worth trying. Maybe then that magic time comes, you know, when you have a chance to do reform. Do it. <laughs> As we discussed, you have maybe once in, in many years uh, this, uh, this opportunity. And uh, final remark from, 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 uh, from my side. Uh, so it proved to be, looks like a, a good choice of a topic of a conference. Indeed, taxes and house prices is irresistible combination. <laughs> so this is really when you merge those two things together, something interesting comes up, and I think, uh, I don't know how this topic evolves in the future, but it looks like uh, this conference started something interesting. I don't know how it's going to develop, but I think, uh, at least in my case, and I hope you as well, I, I like when I learn something new, and this is, was the case indeed this time. I've learned a lot new. I hope the same, the same is true for you, and I hope you enjoyed the conference. Thank you to all of you, and also for very much thank you to the staff who helped to organize to every, every people at the Bank of Lithuania. It's a long exercise, you know, conference business is not so easy. <laughs> but so thank you to all, and to thank you to all of you and to all of us for being here and spending time on these interesting issues. Thank you. <laughs>